Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan, and we're joined here with uh, Nick um, from Hindenburg, and of course from Hindenburg. Uh, we wanted to just do a, a webinar here with you today to go through the whole process of from beginning to end of making a podcast and do it in a kind of conversational way so you can just see how you will be using the software to do this yourself. So let's just start off. Let's just get right into it. When you open up Hindenburg, what are you looking at? So uh, maybe just do a simple record and just walk us through that process. You know, how you select a mic, do a record and what the region looks like, all that stuff. Well, actually, you're the one who's been uh, doing this more than I have. So I can just point and you can tell me what we're looking at. But okay. I, you know, I'll just kick you off. This is what Hindenburg looks like when you open it up. Um can look slightly different depending on how many panes you have open and so on but we're going to get into that later but jonathan so what are we actually looking at we're looking at four tracks uh over here on the left side we are looking at the workspace in the middle um and it, again, as Nick said, you can customize all of these uh, parts here. So um, Hindenburg doesn't have a separate automation window or mixer window or other things like that. The idea is that it's very user friendly and very um, uh, you should be quick to be able to use it. So you open it up, you just start recording and go. Um, and everything with the, how the regions are, they're very, you just grab the region and you, and you do anything that you want to it. You don't have to go anywhere else and all that. So the whole design uh, of it has been to be as user friendly as possible. So if Nick was going to uh, pick a microphone uh, to record on, he would do it over there on the left side. Yep. Yep. Here we have it. And then there we have it. And then uh, there are some other things over there on the left side. That's where, um, you know, there are just a track name. Underneath that is where there's the um, the volume for the track if you were plugging in directly uh, with a USB mic. But Nick is using an interface, so the interface will be controlling the volume. I can, actually that just, is, can I just yeah. uh, say something here? The, sure. the volume here is right now, because we're not recording, this is the volume for the playback. Yeah. So if I had something on the track right now, I could adjust the playback for the entire track. And uh, then I could raise uh, or lower it. And honestly, you should not really use that. So I'm just going to double click on it and it will go back to zero. But as soon as I arm the track, it will then turn into an, um, a volume control or gain control for the microphone but as you were saying this i'm using currently the roadcaster and that has its own gain control which basically means that this is going to be set to zero it doesn't mean that it's not picking up anything it is it's just saying that the device has its own gain control so i am not able to do anything here i can't adjust this at the moment right so two functionalities with that slider depending if you arm the track or or if you don't that's a, a great point um, speaking of arming the track, Nick, uh, you did that by going over to uh, the record icon and, and you clicked on it. Uh, but there is a, a quick key command for that, um, which that I am indeed. addicted to. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is it's, it? it's R. It's just R. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, well, there <laughs> you go. Yeah. Uh, so beneath that, so yeah, very fast, uh, all that stuff. Beneath that is uh, a, a slider for panning. So if you were to have it all, go all the way to the right, it you would have the sound only coming out of your right headphone or speaker and the left, same thing. You'll most likely, and for most cases, have it right in the center where it is for podcast things. But if you needed to, for effects or other things, you could do that. Uh, next to the record button is uh, mute and solo. That makes more sense when you want to hear or isolate tracks when you have a number of tracks uh, all together. So that's a little later in the session. And next to that is this uh, effects bin. Uh, where you can have any effects that come with Hindenburg, like the ones that you see on top. And then the ones that are on the bottom, you might have noticed look a little different. Those because uh, those are third party plugins that uh, you know Hindenburg will find from whatever stuff that you have. So you can have any kind of third party plugins as well. Um, and next to uh, all of that fun stuff, because we'll get into that at the end, uh, is this drop down menu where there's a you can add some more tracks and things, but you also have a special um, Hindenburg effect, which we'll get to in the end. 
So that's just all the stuff of what you're looking at. All the things up on top, like new, file, and all that stuff, we'll get to uh, as we're going along. But uh, Nick, why don't you just uh, do a recording? Yep, let's do that. So all I need to do to make a recording is press the record button. There's a shortcut for that, but let's just start off by doing a recording. Right now I've set it in a mode where there's pre-roll, so that's why it jumped back a few seconds. But as you can see now, it's actually doing a recording. Yes, it's doing a recording. So that's Nick's voice being picked up. And whenever a track is recording in Hindenburg, it'll be the region, which is what we call that piece of audio, uh, that will be in red. Um, so if you were to stop that recording, we'll notice a couple things happen there. So one is that it changed color, and then this other thing happened where we saw some numbers, and it raised that region up. Nick, can you tell us a little bit about what that, what that's, what's going on there? What's going on there? What's yeah. going on is that Hindenburg has built-in auto levels. Now that basically means that uh, every time you add any audio to Hindenburg, it will set the levels to a correct level. Now you can say what in God's name is a correct level. That could be anything. But we have a, a long history of uh, with Hindenburg being a broadcast system. So we uphold all uh, radio broadcast standards. So if you, and it doesn't really matter if you're doing radio, podcast, whatever, internally when you're um, creating a piece, you want all your pieces to be balanced so that the music is not too loud compared to your voice and your voice is not too loud compared to anything else. And typically that is something that you spend a huge amount of time on. So auto levels actually um, measures all the audio that you input it and sets a correct loudness level. Now we should probably not go into what loudness is, but it's just to say that it is actually setting it to the right level. Uh, we could actually try that out um, without talking about loudness or anything like that. If we look here at the bottom, we have a typical meter. This is what's called a QPPM meter. We don't need to get into all that. But just so you know that this is the meters that you will typically find in any broadcast station. Again, not that interesting. But what is interesting is this tiny little number here, which is uh, minus nine, or just these numbers around here. Because back in the day, when you, if you're doing broadcast radio, you, the th rule of thumb would be that your narration should peak at minus nine on a QPPM meter. Obviously, no one can actually remember that, but that is actually uh, the standards that you had, had to uphold to be able to deliver something. If we play back the audio now, try to see what happens on the meter here, mode where there's pre-roll, so that's why it jumped back a few seconds. But as you can see now, it's actually doing a recording. That just fluctuating around minus nine is exactly what you would want. And we do the same for, for music. If we imported some music, it would not sit it there. It would sit it at the correct place for music. So that means that all the levels are set correctly. So you can start mixing them together. And when you output them, it will be nicely balanced, which is fine. But on top of all that, it's not just easy to work with. It's also the professional standards. So you're getting, it's a win-win-win situation. You don't need to think about it, but you're still doing professional work. Since we're at the bottom of the screen, let's maybe talk about a few things there that come up and people ask about, it's okay, you don't know. Uh, so to the left of, of the meter, we see uh, we see something there. Can you, uh, there's the transport bar, which I think feel like is self-explanatory, start, stop, play, rewind, et cetera. Yep. And there are keyboard shortcuts for all of these things. But uh, can you talk a little bit about the vary speed? The vary speed is a function that we put in there uh, actually for, for journalists as well who are listening through a segment. And again, many journalists would be in a hurry, so they didn't necessarily want to hear it all in real time because that will take, well, real time. It doesn't affect the audio that you export. It's just for playback. It's just for playback. It's just because yep. you're in a hurry. Okay. And then there's to the other side, there's in the center of the screen, there's a, a, a clock, which is fairly self-explanatory, I think, but uh, that's where you are in terms of the time of the file, basically what it is. Yes. It also shows uh, some other things. It shows your in and out uh, time. Uh, we haven't got to that yet, but if we had actually made a selection, 
it will show you the in time of your selection, the out time, and the total time of your selection. Right. And let's talk about that. Uh, let's go all into regions. Nick, I'm just going to ask if you could um, make the region a little bit, zoom in and then make it a little uh, larger vertically. Great. Uh, so Nick put in uh, some in and out markers and he made a selection. Let's just talk about the um, what his mouse is doing. So uh, Hindenburg, uh, uh, the mouse, uh, becomes a, it defaults to a multi-tool. So that means that if he's at the bottom of the region, it looks like this little eye beam about the center to the bottom. And that's so he can click around the file and put the playhead, which is that white line, in different places. And he I'm can also sorry. click and drag and make a selection just like that. At about the center of the region, his mouse is going to become uh, that arrow. And that's so he can grab the region to move it to do other things that you want to do. And uh, close to the top, um, actually at the side of the region, if he just hovers over it, he'll see this uh, little trimmer tool. And that's so you can um, yeah, have pieces of it uh, go or you can reveal a region that you've cut. We'll get into that when we do editing. And then at the top there, that line Mind you, you it is, as, sorry, it, it is yeah. nice to know that if, if you do uh, trim something, it, you haven't actually moved anything out, uh, out of the way. It's, it's still there. Everything is non-destructive. Right. So whenever you make a cut in Hindenburg, you have regions on top of each other, they're all still there. And that's the point of the trimmer tool. You can always reveal it to, to have it come back. Um, and then at the top there, that is the volume. Uh, so that is how you would turn either the whole region up or you could isolate one section of it to turn up and down and all that kind of stuff. So you have um, a lot of control. Like I said, you don't have to open up any other windows. You just go right to the region and grab it. In fact, if you were to, uh, can you show us, Nick, uh, how you would put in a fade by grabbing it? Sure. It's the small handles here that you see as uh, the region is highlighted, you can just grab them. And yeah. there you go. You made a fade. You made a fade. Uh, so one, uh, let's let's talk about um, that auto level one more time, just to show people the practical usage of it. Because let's say you were Nick was reading from a script and he was doing a you know a few different takes. You know, as you go, your takes might be a little bit different volume. So uh, the beauty of the auto level is that it's going to match his two different takes. So would you mind doing a pickup, which is uh, also known as a punch in? We can do that. I'll just uh, get rid of these for a sec. So when doing a pickup, um, let's say I've made a mistake right here and f everything from here, I just want to um, replace that. So I just put, put the place, uh, the playhead, sorry, I just put the playhead where I want to punch in and uh, that's all. Uh, when I then press record, it's going to do a pre-roll so I can actually hear what I just said which is going to be confusing because then you're going to hear me say, never mind, you'll get used to it. And then I can just jump in and continue recording. So let's try to do that. That's why it jumped back a few seconds. But as you can see now, I am now doing a new recording. So this is what it would look like. And now I'm going to stop recording again. And there's that auto level. And the two takes match in level. So a super... It's so practical for so many things and a great time saver. And much of the approach is instead of having to fix all of the um, editing and post, you're kind of making the final version of your podcast right from the beginning as you go. Uh, Nick, sometimes folks get this feature uh, mixed up with another feature, which is understandable because the other one is called Magic Levels. Yes. Uh, can you show us a little bit of that and talk talk about what that is? Okay, I'll just need to find a uh, a great session that we can show that on. All right, so here is uh, another session that was recorded um, with multi-track. Hindenburg is a multi-track recorder, and all that means is you can record, if Nick and I were in the same room, I would record me speaking into my microphone and Nick speaking into his microphone. And so you can just assign different microphones to different tracks uh, like we saw before, and that's how this recording was done. Uh, but when that happens, uh, you get this problem, which is that even when I am uh, not speaking, my microphone would be picking up Nick to some degree, and that's called microphone bleed. So yeah, Nick, tell especially us a if, about if we're in the same room. Decision. Now in yeah. separate sides of the Atlantic, it's not such a huge problem. 
right. But yes, microphone bleed is a huge problem if you're sitting in the same room. And we can actually see that uh, here directly in the audio. So we've got someone talking on track one here, but you see the exact same thing on all the other uh, inputs. And you don't want that because you get this really odd sound. It sounds a bit roomy and it doesn't sound that clear. Uh, so typically what you would need to do is find some way of removing that. Do you have any good tips to how t people typically do that? Yeah, if you were doing this uh, manually, you would isolate the parts. So let's say the person is speaking, I think, on track one. Yeah, you'd have to isolate all the parts where their mics being picked up on the other tracks and cut them out away, which is what he did there. Which would take forever. Yes. So, and in this situation, um, auto levels wouldn't work. Auto level will just set the level for that region. What we want to do here is actually be able to detect who's speaking and then reduce the level on everyone else. So that sounds really complicated, but it's not. The way to do it is you select all the tracks that you have, which have this problem. And then I'm going to just jump in here. The way you select tracks, there are a couple oh, of yeah. ways of doing it. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when Nick clicks on a region, that is selecting that region. So if he, that's uh, when the mouse looks like the little pointer, uh, he click on a region, that one is selected. If he holds down the shift key, he can click on more than one of them and select, you know, different ones. There's also a shortcut key, to, a shortcut to just select everything, and that is Option, Command, and A if you're on a Mac, or if you're on Windows, it's Alt, Control, and A, and that just says All. I'll select everything. Good. So now we've done that, mm -hmm. um, and I go up to my menu. Unfortunately, I don't think you can see the top of my menu, but I go up to the Tools you menu. You can. I uh, know you can, but I'm not sure that our users can because uh, that's not part of what I'm recording. Okay. Anyway, you should be able to see the bottom part of it here, but it's in the top menu and you go up to tools and you find this magic levels. Fortunately, there's also a shortcut for that. Now, let me just zoom in here slightly so we might get a slightly better view of what's going to happen. Let's make it as big as we can here. So again, what we wanted to do is make sure that the level on this one here stays up and the rest of them are turned down. And obviously we want to do that for everything. So tools, magic levels, and off it goes. And that's it. So now we can see that it's kept the level here on this one, but it's turned down the level on everything else. And then it found that Someone was speaking here, so it turned down the level on everything else, and so on and so forth. Super handy, super handy feature. Um, you may have noticed there was a little box there that said merge on clothes. All that means is that if any of these uh, regions that Nick had were uh, broken up, that uh, there were various split points in, in them, you could merge it to be one solid region again. That's all that means. We can try that. And we also, yeah. we'll, let's, let's just play around with it. We also have this damping button. That basically means that it, it will reduce the level even more, up to 20 dB, on the other tracks, not the one that is uh, currently being used. So let's try to crank that all the way up and say merge on close. And then it looks like this. Yes. So, uh, Nick, uh, go back a step for, for me, please. Sure. Okay. So you did a, f a few things that um, we want to just highlight to people. Because now we're some of these tools are making it so that you don't have to do as much editing. Because, as we know, editing can take a lot of time. Uh, but let's just talk about a few things here um, that can make that process go faster. Some people really love the feature of linking tracks. So if Nick was to make a selection on one of the tracks uh, and then cut it away, which you can do by those keys that are up on top, or I'm sorry, the icon there, and there are shortcut keys for that as well. Um, so if he was to cut that away, uh, it, it, it snaps the region together. If he was to undo that and delete it and press delete instead, it would leave a space. Uh, 
just like that. So, uh, Nick, if you don't mind, do that again and cut and zoom out a little bit, please. Yeah. Okay, just so we can see. If you see the end of this file, Nick is going to make a selection and cut. The issue is that now this is out of sync with the other ones, okay? Oh, yeah, so okay. in order to, to deal with that, you'd have to do a, a multi-track editing. Um, edit. So the way you do that is you can uh, click and drag across the tracks like that. And then now if you were to cut, they would all go together. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to link tracks. And this has a, a many utilities. But if uh, Nick were to, in the left side of the screen, uh, where it says Bob, if he was to right click there, on Bob or on Linda, uh, you have this, uh, or I'm sorry, underneath that. No, the, actually, I need, to gray select, area. I need to select the tracks first. Yes. So these are the tracks that I want to link together because uh, I want it in the way so every time I do a selection, uh, it's going to be on all these tracks. So then I can right click and say link these tracks together. And now when I drag a selection, it's always going to do it on these tracks. And it's not doing it on all tracks. I could just choose these two tracks and do it on those two if I wanted to. Very handy tool. Uh, and you can always link and unlink tracks as you like. There we go. All linked together again. Okay. So you may have noticed a few things about these regions, and you might be have been asking questions furiously at the screen. So we're gonna we're gonna answer them. Two things that probably stick out to you. One is that they are in different colors, and the other thing is that you see words above uh, above that. So uh, we are gonna demonstrate that is uh, this new transcription technology that we have uh, integrated into the software, and we're going to uh, use a different file and show you how that works what to do with that and how that uh, your editing workflow is going to uh, go from there. Nick, can you walk us through how you would change the color of that region and then how the transcription works? Yes, we can start off with the colors. That is fairly straightforward. We just open a new session here and we have a region. If we right click on the region, we can select show and hide colors. And then we have this little panel that comes up with colors on it. So any region that is selected, we can change the color on that. And okay. you might be thinking, if you've been working with other systems, does this go for the entire track? And no, it doesn't. It is for just for that region. So if I, for instance, split this region, that's another feature we haven't talked about. I can just place my playhead, click on split, I've already done it. I can do it again. Split up here and it will split at the playhead. So now I have three different regions. If I, for no apparent reason, wanted this region to be a separate color because I wanted to highlight that, I can just highlight that region. And when it comes to putting your story together, that can become really, really useful. Instead of just having tracks with different colors, you actually want to have the single story pieces to have different colors. Right. And that that reminds me, um, Hindenburg has been designed to be a storytelling tool. That's the whole approach. So all of the functionality and the features are with designed with that in mind. So uh, we're going to use this with a great feature called the clipboards uh, soon. But uh, we'll, we'll get to that and you'll see the utility of, of being able to uh, change the color of the regions there. Just a great way to organize your clips. But how would we know have the text of what this person is saying how would we get there okay so having something transcribed is really really simple let's just close this down and let's go back to the original piece of audio so that's the entire piece and this is if you've ever listened to any of our tutorials before you've listened to clock so they launched a website called One Frame of Fame. There you go. That must be history by now. Anyway, so what you do is you select it as we did before. You just, if you have selected something, by the way, and you want to unselect it, you just press outside the region, or you can just press escape on your keyboard and it will be unselected. But in this case, we actually do want it selected. So we've selected it, right click on it, and choose transcribe. So Let's do that. Then this menu comes up 
and we can choose a few different things. We can choose the language. We've got quite a few in there. But for now, we're just going to stick to English. And if there was more than one speaker, we could choose multiple speakers. But in this case, it's only one speaker, so there's no point in it actually trying to figure out if there's more than one speaker. So that's it. That's all we need to do, and we press OK. should say that when you're doing the transcription, you actually don't need to be online because all the transcription um, functionality is locally on your computer. Yeah, so that basically means there's there's two sides to that. We've always wanted Hindenburg to be mobile in a sense that it should always be with you. So if you're in the field on a recording or something like that, you should be able to use it. So that's one side of it is mobility. Uh, it's not always important if you're sitting at home doing a podcast, but you might find yourself doing some field work. And in that case, it might be um, interesting to be able to do some editing in a plane or in a bus or something like that. That's one side of it. There's another side of it that's slightly more critical, it, which is that a interview you may, might be doing, well, clearly not this one, but another interview that you've do, been doing might be sensitive. It might be a, a sensitive material. You don't want your source to be revealed or something like that. Uh, not at least until you've um, masked it or covered it or something like that. So your source material, you want to be able to protect that. And you want to be able to protect your source. Um, unfortunately, you if you upload something to the cloud, you're not always sure what's going to happen to it. So we had to think long and hard and go into very long negotiations to be able to do this one thing, which is we wanted the transcription to be on device. Now, it might not be interesting for anyone else in the entire world, but we know that <laughs> our, our users will actually find this immensely important. Uh, you might not right now, but at some point you'll find, oh God, I how do I protect this source? And you know, this is basically why we do many of the things that we're doing uh, to make it a great tool for journalists. Now, you've done this transcription. Can yes. you show us... Uh, where do we see uh, where do we see the words? Where do we see the text? Well, we see the text up here on the region. As soon as we close it, we can already see the text. If I uh, zoom in, uh, you can see that the text is actually already there on the region. That in itself is nice, but not that uh, handy when you actually need to start editing it. Again, unfortunately, you can't see my top menu, but I can tell you up here in the top menu, I go to view. And now hopefully you can see something. So now I've opened the, the manuscript window. And here we can see the actual words that came from there. So let's just try to play that back and see how well it's done. So they launched a website called One Frame of Fame. On the site, you're presented with one frame from the video. So very accurate. Yeah, that's great. So uh, it it's very accurate. What if it wasn't? What if it, it, it got a word wrong? How would you fix that? Uh, the way to fix that is, I'm just trying to see if there's actually a word here. It does get wrong, but I can't actually find one. So, But if there was one, let's say mimic was wrong. You mimic the pose in the frame. So all you need to do is highlight the word mimic, press enter, and then you can, well, basically just type in anything uh, you like. Okay, so that's how you would fix words. How would you... Now, we looked at some cutting before, mm -hmm. um, and that's going to happen. You're going to need to cut things away. You're going to need to do all that. How would you do that now that you have this manuscript here? The exact same way I would do it in any text editing. I would select the, the words. I can do that just as I would do that in any text editor. And again, you can always use shortcuts, but let's just try to cut. And it will cut out those words. And the words, you might have seen that already, was also cut out in the region. Let's just try so to, did a, yeah, let's a try right to do that. click there again. and a new menu came up. Yes. So let's try to take this sentence out. There we go. Select the sentence. And we can see it's also selected here in the region. We right-click on it. 
and let's just cut that out. And let's try to see how that sounds, actually. You mimic the pose in the frame. The result is a frenetic mix of motion and stop action. And there you have it. Great. It is that, that easy. Out. I noticed when you right-clicked that menu, there was there were some other options. There was um, some things folks might not have seen before, like export. Yes, we can actually export the text. That can come in handy for all kinds of different things. For instance, if you're using this for subtitles for a video, or you want to use this for show notes in a podcast, or something like that. And even going back to the um, the broadcast side of things, many broadcast stations are actually required to have transcriptions of all their segments. So this would be a great way for them to actually be able to do that. They can just export the text here in different formats. You can have it as a text format, but you can actually also export in uh, different subtitle formats and in JSON, if you want to explain that one, and in HTML. Um, if you are ever asked for something like an SRT file, well, now you know, you can actually do that. Super handy. Um, so we talked about, we mentioned a little bit, uh, these clipboards, um, yes. and we know where we're going to find them because they're in that view dropdown menu where all the other windows are. Um, so let's, let's look at the clipboards and, and talk a little bit about that. Yep. So, oh, let me just wait a minute. Just, just gonna open a new session, mate. Okay. Uh, did you know, by the way, if you copy and paste something from a different session, it takes a transcription with it. Uh, no, I didn't know that. Oh, there you go. Pretty handy, isn't it? Yeah. Honestly, I, I, uh, you know, you did that cut, and I was like, you never really know, uh, unless you did that exact cut and you tried it out before. Worked perfectly. Worked perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Okay. Anyway, we've just opened the, the clipboard, and uh, right now it doesn't look that interesting. We have four different groups. The point of the clipboard is, let's go back to why we do these things. When you're doing a story, you will typically have, well, not typically, but you can be in a situation where you have many different pieces of uh, audio. So if you've done an interview, for instance, you might have interviewed someone for a couple of hours, uh, but you only want to find the, the good sound bites. In the, <laughs> just about to say, in the olden days, in, in one way of going about that would be to find a, a sound bite that could be this one in your audio, and then you could put that on a scratch track and then you could find that or locate that later on. And this is typically a way that people have been working for ages. But what you will find very quickly is that you'll have many, 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 many regions lying around. It could be multiple interviews. You, you could be trying out different things. So the point of the clipboard is to have somewhere where you can store all your sound bites so you can organize them, and then you can start mixing later on when you have all the pieces together. So that might uh, sound slightly complicated right now, but let's just see how we can actually do that. If I just for a second, just close the manuscript, I'm just going to show how it works. If we just do it here. There we go. So we're going to highlight a clip like this. And now we're going to put it in a group. So I just hold down the command key or that's control key on Windows, and yep. drag it into my group. So now it's over here, and I can play back the clip. On the site, you're presented with one frame from the video. You mimic the pose in the frame. Get. So it's a really, really, really good way. And once you start using it, you'll there's no turning back. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And it doesn't look like anything right here, but if I just sh show you a, a different session quickly, what a, a finished piece could look like. It could look something like this. This is pretty straightforward uh, piece where you have some narration, a couple of different interviews, but look at what's going on in the clipboard. There's like dozens of different clips there. In this case, there we have uh, renamed the groups um, 
So we have the interview bites with Teddy, Karen, Elliot, and so on. And we can always go in here and find them. I have this scar on my finger right here. And if I wanted to use them, I could always just drag them into the, the workspace. So let's move that out of the way and put him in here instead. He's aggressive. There we go. Aggressive. I have this scar on my finger right here, right? You see the scar there? The real bottom line is... And so on and so forth. So putting your radio piece together uh, using the clipboard is just such a time saver. Now, is it possible to use the clipboard and get those clips from the manuscript window? It is indeed. So let's go back to the clip that we had before. I basically just copied the clip from the, the session that we had before. And as you can see, once it's transcribed, the transcription is still there. And if I open the manuscript window, the manuscripts will just show the transcription as before. If I now highlight the this sentence we had here before, let's take this sentence here. So it's highlighted in the workspace. I could go up here and do as I did before, just hold command and then drag that into a group. But I can do the exact same thing directly from the manuscript. So I'm just holding down command, click on the text. And there you go. It's in the clipboard. Easy peasy. Great. And it even actually shows you the, uh, the words um, from the transcription. If you want to change it, uh, you can just do that. You can just go in and rename it. And I see there that you can search in the clipboard and find any of the clips that you need. Yes. Right now, obviously, uh, we, do, we don't have a lot of clips, but if we go back to the, the session from before where we had a huge amount of clips, we could then just say we only want to see the clips of Teddy. There we go. And we filtered out everything so we just seen Teddy. Now, with this complicated session, I noticed that there were a lot of sounds in there and music. Uh, Hindenburg has an onboard sound library. Can you show yes, us a little does. bit about that? I can indeed. So going up to view again and to sounds, and then we get this other clipboard, which is called sounds. And in here, this actually points directly to Soundly, which is a Norwegian company that does sounds, and they're really, really good at it. And every installation of Hindenburg will come with a access to a portion of their sound library. If you have the gold, well, not the gold version, if you have the premium version of Hindenburg, you will even get a larger set of sounds. But everyone gets some sounds. So if we wanted to add some sound, do you have any sound that you would like to add? I would like a car sound, please. A car sound. Okay, let's see. Let's go in here, search for car. Any particular make? <laughs> the second one down is going to be fine. Well, we can go for Ford if you like. Okay. You get the, the, the names here. Um, again, they might be a bit long, these names. So if you wanted to, you could just pull out the sound library so it was slightly larger. You could also dock it somewhere else. If you wanted to, you could uh, dock it down here. So now we have the, the sounds down here. And so we've got a door from a Ford. And if we uh, click on the arrow or just press the play button. There you go. A Ford door. And we can take that sound right here, just drag it directly into our session. It's probably not going to make any sense whatsoever putting it here, but let's try it anyway. Tears have gone into it. Literally. They have this <laughs> broke perfectly. <laughs> um, so I also heard a few things there, Nick. That is, first off, that is uh, great to have that on board. Just very easy. You don't have to go anywhere else. Uh, so many sounds are, are right there for you. I also heard some music, and I heard that it was ducked down. Uh, can you walk us through how you would make um, a sound bed with music and do a duck? Yes. The way to do that is to make a selection of where you want the music to duck. So I could just do a selection like this. 
and I can easily see that this is exactly where I want the music to be lowered. So I've made the selection. I can grab the gain line, which we've talked about before. And now the gain will do something different than before. It won't take the gain for the entire region. It will only do it for this selection. And it even gives us these lovely curved handles. So if we play back this audio now. Teddy Sadaka has been in the clothing business since he was a teenager. So we can hear the music is going all the way down. That's not exactly what we wanted. It's going too far. So what we can actually do, and we can do this in real time, is we can adjust it like this. Teddy Sadaka has been in the clothing business since he was a teenager in the 1970s. Back when his parents... So in real time, you can actually set the levels just the way that you want them. Okay, so that's how you put in a duck for, for your music. How would you deal with a sound bed? Yes, we might need to explain what a sound bed is before we uh, continue. The difference between a duck and a sound bed is that a duck will just duck down between some, uh, when something needs to be audible on top of it and then come up again. A sound bed will just go down and stay down. And you use these two things all the time. So typically with music, you use ducks all the time. But if you're using sound effects like the ocean comes in or something like that you'll start with the uh, something being uh, let's see if we can find an ocean this mm, seaside right now we can just add that here in the 1970s. so let's say we want to open uh, the uh, the story here with some seaside But then we want it to uh, to fade down and stay down underneath uh, the rest of um, this audio, but not come up again. So what we do instead of just selecting the entire area where we wanted it to, to be under, because that could be very long, um, we then just select a small area, and this is the area that we want the fade, the length of the fade. It might not sound intuitive the first time you hear it, but it makes a lot of sense when you try it. So now instead of dragging inside, where we made it a duck before, I'm just going to undo that. We're going to drag outside, and then it goes like this instead. So now we've made this lovely little fade down, and it stays down all the way. That's called a sound bed, a bed of sound underneath. I guess like a bit of flowers or something like that. And we can all uh, do the exact opposite if we wanted it to show up suddenly. So then we could just do a selection again. This is the length of my fade and drag up outside there. There you go. And you can even see there's a tool tip saying how loud it should be. It's called green and snappy. So combining these two really, really simple tools, you can make very, very complex uh, mixes. And it will take you a very, hopefully a very, very short time to actually learn these two different tools. And you can make something that is really, really complex. And if we just go back to the original version of this um, of this session here, it might look very complex. We've got all kinds of things going on. And if we, on top of that, add the, uh, the manuscript, it might look daunting. But let's try, try to break it down quickly so we can just get an idea. We have a region with some... That's transcribed, and that is basically um, just the, the narration. It goes like this. Teddy Sadaka has been in the clothing business since he was a teenager. So we already know how to do that. That was pretty straightforward. And down here we have some sounds. We have some factory sound, uh, some steam press, uh, another sound I can't remember which is, and then we have some music. All that was... We know that was easy to just drag in there. We just found some sounds in the sound library and just added some music. And if you look at what's done to them, it's exactly the same. Here is just a small sound bed. And on this one, there is also a sound bed that goes further down to another sound bed. So the tools that you need to make something that is sounds really interesting um, are all there. You can learn that within maybe a couple of hours and 
you get really, really good at it with just a little bit of practice. So, and that is really at the end of the day what we're trying to achieve with Hindmo Pro. It is to give, inspire you, so to speak, to to make something that sounds interesting and fun. And to be honest, you know, I don't know about you, uh, Jonathan, but I just love doing this. It's just fun. It's like playing with Lego. It's you can build worlds with sound. So let's say you've done this and you've you've put you've built your world. You're ready to. <laughs> To <laughs> you're ready to for other people to know about this world that you built. You're ready to to show it. But yes. before you do that, you want to make sure that you know everything's uh, the quality of the sound is as high as you can get it. So, can you talk a little bit about the uh, effects that are there? Maybe some noise reduction um, yeah. and a little bit about the special effect that we have called the voice profiler. Getting to the effects is over here on the track control. On the track control, we have this effect button, which opens up the a bin, so to speak, for all your effects. And at the moment, there isn't any. If we click on one of the slots here, we can choose amongst the, the built-in effects and any other effects that you might have on your computer. Right now, we're just going to have a quick look at the noise reduction. It looks like this. It has one knob. And it's pretty straightforward to use. The way that you use it is you just play back the uh, audio. It's just solo this track, so we're only listening to this. Sadaka has been in the clothing business since he was a teenager in the 1970s. And as we're playing back the audio, you can see that it's learning from that audio where the noise is. So let's just play a little more. Back when his parents started Apparel Production Incorporated, this factory on 39th Street. So that must be enough. And then all we need to do is just dial in how much of the effect do we want, or in this case, how much do we want it to remove the noise. And that's the it, really. clothing business since he was a teenager in the 1970s. So that's how you use noise reduction. And the idea is that all the effects are, are very approachable because most of them are just one knob. But we have one special effect for those folks who would like to have a saved custom EQ. And that's the, the voice profiler. Can you show us where, uh, where they find that and how that works? The voice profiler, it's, it solves a problem that most people have when they're trying to clean up the sound. And when we talk about cleaning up the sound in, in this situation, it's not about removing noise. It's making your sound as present as possible. And it, it's, it's just difficult. It's difficult to do because if you're working from home on your laptop, uh, you might even be editing in a noisy environment, what have you. It's difficult to figure out what should you actually sound like. So what you can do with the voice profiler is you can find a recording of yourself that sounds good. This could, for instance, be Clark. So they launched a website called One Frame of Fame. And this is Clark when he sounds his best. We know that because he told us. The voice profiler, with that, we can then learn from this piece of audio. This only works for Clark, so you just find your own audio and do the same thing. So now we've created a profile, and we can just save that, and we can save that as Clark. But we've already done that, so we don't need to do that again. The point of it is then... Now we don't need this anymore. All this is over and done with. But we can now do a new recording with Clark that sounds like this. So they launched a website called One Frame of Fame. You might be able to hear that this sounds terrible, but in many situations, it's, it's not even that bad. And it's really difficult to figure out if you haven't had a reference, if you didn't hear the good version of Clark, does this sound good? So they launched a website called One Frame of Fame. And... If it doesn't sound good, what should I do about it? And when do I stop? So we ask if it sounds good. So this is the whole point of the voice profiler. If, because that actually knows what it should sound like. So we can go in here and find Clark's profile. There we have it down there. And apply that. That's all you need to do. Let's try to have a listen again. So they launched a website called One Frame of Fame. So when you've done this, you've made your beautiful world, you've cleaned up the sound, you're ready to put it out into the world. There are a couple of ways of doing this. 
Uh, the first way is to do an export. Yeah. And we can now take this multi-track session because no one can actually play back this session right now except us. So we want to export it as a single file. And you can choose different file formats. We basically support all kinds of different file formats. Um, probably you'll be looking for MP3. So let's try that one. And then you can get to choose between different qualities of it. If this isn't enough uh, for you, if you want to go into more details, you can go into options. And here you can set even more, power, um, even more, what's the word I'm looking for there, Jonathan? Parameters. Parameters, thank you. And one of the ones that are we're not going to get into that. You can, on our website, there's, uh, I've made a very detailed uh, video about all these settings. But the one that we want to have a look at right now is this one down here called loudness. Loudness is, we use, when we set the auto levels, we were using loudness. And those, uh, then we were setting the loudness levels for the individual pieces of audio. What we're doing now is we're looking at your entire session or your entire show and setting a loudness level for that. And that will come in handy when you're exporting a podcast, for instance, because a podcast needs to be exported at minus 16 LUFS. Now, you don't need to get into why that is. That's just the way things are. We all agree that minus 16 is the way to go. So that's what everyone is doing, minus 16. You can see there are some different ones here, and we have them in there because uh, you might also be doing other things than just a podcast. If you're doing a, uh, a radio show, for instance, uh, then you'll be asked to deliver, especially if you're in America, for uh, at uh, minus 24 LUFS. And you have all that here at your fingertips. So what then would happen is then you say, okay, that is what we want to do. Let's make a podcast. And there we have it all done. What you would do with this is you would then take that MP3 file and you would you would put it up on your podcast hosting site. Uh, you don't uh, put it directly on sites like for Apple or something like that. Typically, you give it to a hosting site like Libsyn or Blueberry or many others, and they uh, distribute it. So we have a, a clever way of eliminating one of the steps. Exactly. Because instead of you going to a website, uploading, as you were saying, Jonathan, what you can do is use our publish tool. And in our publish tool, you can set up your export destination. So, for instance, if we were talking about Libsyn, we could just choose that here and say, this is my podcast. And what I'm doing here is, once and for all, setting up that destination. I don't have to do this for every single episode. I just need to do this once. Just saying that I have a, a Libsyn account, um, and then I can set up the file type that I would typically use, in this case, an MP3. Let's say it was medium quality. Here you see, again, the loudness. There we go, I'm going to set it at minus 16. And then you just input your credentials for your account. And once that is set up, you'll find it here in your list. The point of all this is that once it's all set up once and for all, you only need to open up your publish tool, choose whatever export destination you want to export to. You can choose multiple, to be honest. And they will all have can all have different settings. For instance, my archive, I can basically create a version of this show, put it into my local um, folder on my computer, but I want that to be in an uncompressed format, like a WAV format. So I can set that up. I could have one go into an FTP server if you want to be um, go that way. Um, or, as I have here, one going to my Buzzsprout account. And they're all different uh, file formats and all that different levels. But, since I've already set them up just once, when I come in here, let's say I've just created this show now, this is how quickly it can be done. I say publish, I want it to go to these three different destinations. Great, publish. It's going to create the different files that I need. 
different file formats, different levels, and it's going to basically just uh, send them off to the correct destinations, if it's either my local folder or up to a Buzzsprout uh, account. So thank you so much for uh, staying with us and going through this production process from beginning to end. Uh, and hopefully you can now produce your podcast with with uh, very few hurdles in your way. We've designed this to be a very accessible uh, series of uh, tools so that you can focus on being a storyteller and not get hung up on technical hassles. Exactly. And there are obviously more things than we've been able to show you now. And you can dive down into our archive and hopefully get some inspiration. Um, and hopefully we can be back with, uh, with more like this. This was fun. <laughs> All right, bye everybody. Bye now.